I speak of peace, therefore, as the necessary rational end of rational men. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war, and frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Last night I had the strangest dream I never dreamed before I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. Welcome to the Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. OuterLimitsRadio.com I'm your host, Ryan. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Tonight we're going to focus on a great, brave, incredible American named General Smedley Butler. He wrote a fantastic book called War is a Racket. I believe he is so brave and so courageous because he's one of the first people to point out and identify the military-industrial complex. And what that is, is that is war for profit. And at this time, real quick, I want to bring out the fact that there are many people uh, worldwide who honor their troops. They say, we love the troops, we honor the troops. But I have to say that I think in America, they disrespect the troops in so many ways. And I'll give you the two biggest reasons why I feel they're disrespectful for the troops. You know, They say that the troops are fighting for their rights, yet they don't know what their rights are. Many Americans don't even know what their constitutional civil liberties are that these brave men and women are dying for. And I think it's disgusting. And if these people really loved and respected the troops, they would do everything they can to bring them home, to put them out of harm's way. And also, I think that they should bring to justice or ask questions about people who've led troops to their death based on lives. Look at what happened in the Vietnam War. Look what happened in the Second Gulf War. I mean, some of these things are just reprehensible. And I feel that the greatest way to honor the troops is to know what they're fighting for and you know, honor and fight for their truth, fight and understand why they died. So their future brothers and sisters, our future brothers and sisters, don't have to die unless it's absolutely necessary. Smedley Butler, again, talked about the in military-industrial complex. In the U.S. alone, in the fiscal budget of 2015, 54% of the budget was spent on military spending, which is almost $600 billion. And that outweighs health care. That outweighs all other things. So – when these milk companies have guaranteed contracts, there's a permanent war economy. Peace is awful to a war-based economy. The same way a healthy population is detrimental to the pharmaceutical industry because what are they doing? They're selling cures. They're trying to sell things to treat an ailment. And just like the military, they're selling weapons in order to fight these wars. But I think that peace is easy. Peace is so easy. I'll explain how. You walk into a store, you walk into a place you've never been before, and chances are you're probably not going to have an armed conflict with some of the people. You're going to be cordial to each other. I think it's the way human beings are. This idea that humans are war-based, I think it's bullshit. I think human beings are actually peaceful-based, and it takes a lot to psych yourself out, to develop hatred, and to develop the ability of just killing someone and being uncomfortable with it. I, th- I think that is something that takes a lot of effort. And I believe that peace is entirely possible and war is unnatural. And today, as we honor all men and women across the world who've given their lives and sacrificed themselves for the freedom of others, let us especially honor Smedley Butler, who took on the powers that be and whose true intention was to put an end and expose war for profit. Let us begin tonight's program. Joining us now is Sandy Kelson, an attorney and teacher who's taught classes that include lessons about the Vietnam War, whether or not America is a republic or an empire. And he also is um, very thoroughly well-versed in Smedley Butler. Mr. Kelson, what can you tell us about the life of Mr. Butler, and why do you feel he's a significantly historical – why do you feel he's an important figure? Okay, briefly, uh, Smedley Butler was uh, described 
regularly as one of the most conscious driven and controversial U.S. Marines. Uh, he was the youngest Marine to be given the rank of Major General, highly decorated. He had two medals of honor. He was born in Pennsylvania, 1881, and he was enamored as a young boy with Civil War stories. So when he was 17 years old, with great enthusiasm, he joined the Marine Corps. And that would be 1898, and he was shipped off pretty quickly to the Philippines War. And from there, a couple of years later, he went to serve in the Boxer Rebellion in China. And uh, he was in the Marine Corps for over 33 years. In 1931, he was passed over for Commandant of the Corps. And that was a snub because he was so outspoken. He had come to believe, and he was articulating, that the United States military involvements overseas was uh, based upon uh, invading these countries for the benefit of the wealthy American business interests. And he has a very famous paragraph that sums up, I think, what we should know about Butler in a nutshell. And he said, I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for American oil interest in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. The record of racketeering is long. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909-12. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interest in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three city districts. We Marines operated on three continents. So that's it in a nutshell about Smedley. So do you think that, I mean, that's pretty, it's at that time, I guess it would be considered shocking, but even even today's, it would probably be even more shocking. Why, why would he say uh, such things, and why do you feel that maybe those comments were not embraced by, by mainstream, were not even embraced on a large scale by the general public? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of questions there. Number one, after he got out of the Marine Corps, he was on a speaking tour of the United States. He spoke over 300 days a year for several different years. And he spoke the way I just read at these events. And he was a hero with World War I veterans. And uh, he went to uh, the VFWs all over the country speaking this way. I'm a member of VFW. I tried to get them to reprint one of his articles to compare it with what was going on today, and that was declined. He can't speak that way at the VFW anymore. Uh, but he was telling the truth. If he saw what was going on today, and I'd have to say, if we would go up to probably the uh, Iraq war. Up to that time, he would recognize what was going on, I think, as the same thing that he saw going on. Things have changed recently. It's getting much worse. My interpretation for what it's worth is this. Historically, the countries that had the strongest overpowering economies were those in charge of empire. Talking about Smedley Butler, the message that he has and his lasting impact on American culture, do you feel – what do you think would be some of the greatest lessons that Smedley Butler could offer America at this hour of our history? Well, I think that uh, what Smedley Butler could offer is what we have a lot of people offering. You have a lot of activists out there. They're doing a lot of things. Uh, we have some that are considered leaders, but those leaders aren't anybody. You know, Smedley would be a leader, I would assume, uh, without an enraged public. Uh, if you go in the civil rights movement, which I think is a beautiful model for how to uh, try to uh, get freedom, uh, 
Martin Luther King was just coming to speak at a church of people who were all riled up and angry. And when he got done, they applauded to such an extent he was shocked and surprised, and he became a spokesperson. He wasn't a leader. Everything was done by consensus among a group of activists who were selected by the masses. This has to be done from the grassroots to be successful. Leaders can be co-opted. Leaders can be shot. But the movement has to continue. So Smedley would be, I would hope, a perfect example of what Smedley would be, I would think, would be Subcommandant Marcos with the uh, uh, Zapatistas in Mexico. He's the mass guy that's a poet. He takes his marching order from peasants. So I would hope that Smedley would be serving in, in that capacity. Mr. Kelton, thank you so much. That was a real riveting and uh, interesting interview about Mr. Smedley Butler. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Joining us now is John Grant, a Vietnam vet, a member of Veterans for Peace, a journalist and founder of This Can't Be Happening. You can learn more about that by thiscan'tbehappening.net. Mr. Grant, why do you respect and admire Spendley Butler? Oh, wow. Um, Spedley Butler is an amazing uh, historical figure in, in American history, especially in the American history of um, imperialism uh, as it's reached out into the world. Uh, Smedley Butler was 16 years old in, in 1898 during the Spanish-American War. He was raised as a Hicksite Quaker in Westchester, uh, maybe uh, you know, eight, ten miles uh, west of Philadelphia. Uh, in 18, 18, late 1890s, his father was a congressman, a Quaker, uh, Quaker and a congressman in Pennsylvania. And the U.S. Marine Corps was just fledging organization as America was sort of bursting at the seams and in, in that era with industrialism rising after the Civil War and railroads expanding to the West and uh, you know, America was just uh, this bursting at the seams thing, and this young kid, Quaker kid in Westchester, decided he wanted to be one of these new Marine lieutenants that they were uh, commissioning that would, you know, ride on board American ships as they, as they reached around the world. And his father and his mother finally signed off at 16, and he became a, a U.S. Marine as a Quaker. Um, and, of course, what's interesting to me, uh, I was married as a Quaker and a tender, and uh, this whole idea of pacifism amongst Quakers, um, some are pacifists, some aren't. In his case, he wasn't. But at the same time, they're very peace-oriented people and, and, and very confident people in, in what they call in the Quaker religion, clearness, getting clear on things. And um, this this man, uh, to me, exhibited this. So he has a long career, I'll cut short, and we can kind of tag back around on it. He has two Congressional Medals of Honor in his military career, uh, one in Mexico for some intrigue that he did involving politics and things. And the other one was, I believe, from... Uh, the, the Boxer Rebellion in China, which he was involved in. He was also, after you know, being a young kid, 16, as a lieutenant uh, in the, the Spanish-American War on Cuba, he landed on Guantanamo, what's now Guantanamo. Um, he was trained by these old, gnarly uh, Civil War veterans who were, you know, had seen everything. They were probably, some of them, in their 50s even, uh, and they sort of trained this young kid. And then he went to uh, Central America, did a lot of things in Central America. By this time, maybe he's a major. Uh, he was in Haiti, a long episode in Haiti. Uh, amazing incidents of courage and, 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 and that he's very a legend for. So he's on the battlefield uh, and he's fighting all the – I mean, is he actively in the heat of combat as a Marine? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying so. He was actively on the ground for a lot of these wars. 
Oh, absolutely, especially in the Boxer Rebellion in, in Beijing, or Peking, I guess they called it at the time. They went to save a, a garrison there. Uh, you know, they marched in you know, with other international soldiers, very bloody episodes that he was certainly part of. Um, he had a he had a huge anchor and eagle world anchor and eagle the marine symbol carved in his chest as a tattoo. <laughs> One of the characteristics. Okay. So it seems like and he was a small guy, like a banty rooster kind of guy. And uh, one incident, it's very interesting to know, he's very legend for, it was in Nicaragua, he's going on a train with 100 troops uh, on board, uh, they were trying to clear their train from uh, Managua to Corinto on the coast to pick up more U.S. Marine troops, and they, the, the local rebellion elements, uh, peasant army, were preventing the train, the first uh, the train they'd gone through before had failed, and they humiliated the the, the U.S. troops and sent them packing, walking back on the, the red rail, and he decided, no, this, this was not what Americans were about. So he led the next train in the front from the engine, and they stopped. They had a blockage, and he went out, and he confronted, uh, you know, with all these peasant troops with machetes, and he confronted the rebel leader who said, you're not going, and turn around, and the guy pulled a pistol and put it right into Smedley Butler's chest and said, if you move, I will shoot you. And then Smedley Butler grabbed the pistol, yanked it out of the man's hand, emptied it into the ground, and threw it away in such a quick, rapid moment that all of the Nicaraguan men's troops and the Marines all started laughing. But he just completely defused what could have been a slaughter by this brash act. And so he's, this is one of the legends of Smedley Butler and uh, things like that. And ultimately, the arc of his career ends up in World War, you know, just before World War II, you know, the rise of, of fascism in the 30s. Uh, he's for a while, believe it or not, the police commissioner of Philadelphia under prohibition. And he after two years, decides he's not going to do this anymore because he's told not to raid certain, you know, favored speakeasies and things like that. And he said, the hypocrisy, he can't stand it. He quits, goes back to the Marine Corps. Uh, and then he uh, runs afoul of Benito Mussolini. He, he, he damns Mussolini for an event where Mussolini ran over a child with a journalist on board, and he, he makes a speech that Benito Mussolini is a louse, and he's ordered by Stimson, the Secretary of War, to apologize to Benito Mussolini, and he refuses and is court-martialed by Stimson as a general and uh, takes it to the – to the, to the, he, he goes public speaking around the country and wins the day because – you know, he knows that Benito Mussolini is a bum, although at the time, in the 30s, you know, the Americans were more favorable to fascism at that period. So um, the Americans were more favorable to fascism? I want to pause it right there and just okay, get your sure. – you just because you said something interesting. How would you compare mm -hmm. Americans' attitude towards fascism in the 30s compared to where they are right now? Do you think the Americans have a more well, or less – Well, the one way to attack it, I think, uh, of course – Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, Germany fascism and Italian fascism are very, very different. The, the, the Italian fascism is more historically comical in some way, where obviously Hitler is a monster. But the Hitler that we know now, the monster that we know now, uh, didn't exist until after World War II or during World War II. Uh, before that, Fortune magazine and other magazines, photographers – we're going to to Germany and to, and to Italy to see what uh, you know a success fascism was. You know the joke was it was making the trains run on time. You know as, as far as Fortune magazine, a Wall Street sort of slick magazine. You know this was the kind of German miracle. It was making things work. The tough guy approach was actually you know making the trains run on time and making businesses work and all that kind of thing. So there was a a very strong positive uh, public relations, if you will, 
uh, journalist kind of uh, element in America that was all for Adolf Hitler. You know, George W. Bush's uh, grandfather, Prescott Bush, was, you know, dealing in business with the Nazis at that point, or the fascists, German fascists, business people. Uh, you know, these are things we don't talk about too much in this culture, but there was a very much... Um, you know, in bed with some of those people at the time. But, of course, even my father, a Wesleyan, had, had sort of tendencies like that. And then, of course, was a my father was a PT boat captain in World War II and acquitted himself well against the fascists. But there was a period before the war when things really came to a head and, and the, the depth of their Nazis' depravity became evident, you know, um, but before that, you know, they, they were, you know, as I say, making the trains run on time. And so Smedley Butler weighed into that and being a truth-seeking Quaker-type guy uh, said, look, I, I can't abide by this. This guy is a bum with this journalist uh, son of um, Vanderbilt, uh, the, 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 the magnet Vanderbilt, uh, ran over a child. And the journalist said, whoa, 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 no, son, never look back. You know, and um, and and Smedley called him out on that sort of uh, cold-bloodedness, and he was ordered to uh, apologize by the Secretary of War, and he refused. And so then, after that, he wins that. Uh, he's passed over for uh, Marine Commander, although he's the the ranking Marine Commander because he never went to Annapolis, and he's sort of the ground-up kind of general, the, the soldier's general, if you will, and that angers him. And he eventually gets so angry that he writes this book called War is a Racket, in which he basically uh, condemns all his past experience as a, you know, I was a gangster for the Brown Brothers Bank in New York, in, in Nicaragua, I could have taught... Al Capone a thing or two, and this kind of uh, language, uh, as, again, in the late 30s, he does this. He goes around the country and makes speeches. He speaks to the bonus marchers. Uh, and then there's ultimately in his career, there's this plot uh, of, uh, you know, to, to make the long story short, elements of Wall Street financing research into the black shirts, the silver shirts, and, and the brown shirts in Europe, who were disgruntled World War II, one bets, a lot of them, that there was a 500,000 member American legion of some disgruntled World War I vets, that these people had this idea that they were going to turn this into a fascist army with a man on a white horse, they needed a general to lead it, and uh, they chose Smedley Butler, which was in a a tragic or a fatal choice on their part. They should have sold somebody like Douglas MacArthur, who was a true fascist in that sense. Uh, whereas they chose the wrong guy, who was uh, sort of the people's general. He got a journalist involved. He got the House on American Activities involved. There was a hearing, and it was you know made public. And I think then Roosevelt went to these people and said, "Look, either you're I'm going to." push for treason against you or you leave me alone. And it was in a sense the, you know, people going against uh, FDR like they've analogously gone against uh, Barack Obama in, in, in currently. Okay, well, let's just, so, I want to just take it back to one thing about the book. Sure, go ahead. About war is a racket. Long story short, what is the most, what are the two or three most concise messages about that book? Um, well, it's it's not a book; it's a pamphlet, pamphlet right. pretty much. It's short, and but it's basically uh, it has a vein in which it talks in the spirit of talking to parents and mothers of don't send your children to these wars because these wars are you know all about uh, you know rich men's wars and things like that. Uh, he goes into some history. It's been a long time since I read it, and for details, I need to probably read it again. But um, you know, it, it's basically uh, telling truth to the to, to the American people. Again, this to me so, uh, harks back to being a Quaker and truth telling. Well, what's the truth? Like what's the truth that's in the book? I mean, you know, my understanding is that you read the book and then he t explains mm -hmm. that that you go to war because it, there you there's a lot of money to be made. 
But then we, if you right. offer that to the attention of someone, then some, some people will right. say, well, you don't know that that's not correct and that there are a lot of wars that need right. to be fought. How would you, what would you say to somebody who says that, you know what, we need to fight a lot of wars in order to keep uh, well, America safe or any country well, safe? Well, I, I think the, the how this impacts on, on the story and the history of Smedley Butler to me is very interesting because he dies in the Philadelphia Naval Hospital from stomach cancer in June of 1940, uh, and he's gone. He had all these problems with the Department of the, you know, the Marine Corps, uh, the head of the War Department, all this. And he's written wars a racket. He's gone around the country, make these speeches. He writes in, in these magazines and all this stuff, very subversive stuff. And then World War II comes along, Pearl Harbor. Uh, had had he lived through World War II, I have no doubt that he would have corralled around and, you know, become part of the, the program because World War II, you know, is is arguably something that was unavoidable for the United States and something the United States had to participate in. Um, Why did the United States have to participate in it? And you actually – you're saying that you think that Smedley Butler would have been as part of uh, – Well, you can – you know, I think people still argue about that. I know people who were, who were conscious objectors during World War II. They're probably old and pretty old now, but uh, – uh, you know, I think the, the 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 Germans were were so bad that that in a sense uh, something had to be done. Now we can do a lot of historical analysis and deconstruction about you know again things that that were not perfect. You know that uh, you know the FDR may have known about Pearl Harbor and let it happen so to have a cause you know cause a bell uh, you know cause for war and things like that. So it's very complicated. But you, I don't think World War II is 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 one thing. Uh, Vietnam, for instance, modern war. Uh, I can't imagine that Smedley Butler, what I know of him, would have gone along with something like Vietnam because Vietnam, the Vietnamese never threatened us in any way. They were our allies during World War II. We we fought with them against the, the Japanese who had intimidated and cowered the French armies, the Vichy French armies, into their barracks. And at the end of uh, World War II, which is the key, 45, the key date for Vietnam, you know, Truman makes this decision to let, to support the French recolonizing France, where, uh, Vietnam, whereas someone like uh, FDR uh, talked about, uh, you know, after World War II, uh, letting uh, decolonizing European colonization, decolonizing places like Vietnam. So uh, instead, he has this cold warrior vice president who then takes us into 30 years of war in Vietnam, when, you know, these the Vietnamese were actually at the time our allies. Um, you know, and so I think someone who was so intimate with American arrogance and American exceptionalism as expressed in military uh, uh, interventions around the world, especially, you know, supporting, you know, the Brown Brothers banks and other capitalist elements in these little countries of Central America and Haiti and whatnot, he would have seen Vietnam as more of that, so even Iraq. What about other Afghan wars? What other wars do you think in the, maybe the last 25 years do you think that Smedley Butler would have actually endorsed or been supportive of? Well, you know, first of all, i got to say, look, it's none of my business. I can't tell you what Smedley Butler would have done. Sure. I'm just, well, my own experience, speculating. Yeah, well, you're but looking at his policies, I, I, looking about what he's written. Yeah. And if you were to think about Well, I, I think Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, I, I, I think uh, – uh, he would have seen it quite differently. He would have, I would imagine, have seen, you know, no sense, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're active in the world, even militarily, um, you know, so it's not that we ignore elements like al-Qaeda that are in Afghanistan, but there were people at the time who were saying, well, it should be treated, you know, literally like a police crime or, you know, a crime, international crime to be addressed in that mode, you know, even militarily in that mode, but not as something where you send an entire army to invade and occupy 
and, and muck up the place like we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so someone with the sensibilities of a Smedley Butler and, and uh, the, the background of a Smedley Butler, I think, would have questioned all three of those words, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Okay, so if you look at Smedley Butler's work, he says that there's a lot of money to be made through military interventions. Does, if you look at his work, can you right. cite that what he reveals is a formula that is not only just applied to the United States but other countries throughout the world? And do you feel that war for profit was something that happened long before World War II, that there were other wars throughout America's history that were fought specifically? Well, again, again for all of the, the – the, the wars in, in Central – I've been to Central America in the 80s and 90s. I made a trip, number of trips as a photographer and was in the rebel zones and all sorts of things. Um, so I understand uh, you know, Central America a little bit. I recognize it. Uh, and, and what he – the whole – you know, from Teddy Roosevelt on of, of you know, the Spanish-American War and this bully idea of, you know, we, for one thing, we – we basically stole Panama from Colombia in order to make the canal, which, of course, was Teddy Roosevelt's baby at the time. Now, the canal may be a good thing for, for international t you know, commercial traffic and all that, but there, there is this American bulliness using the FDR or TR's um, terms that, uh, that Smedley Butler – ends up historically as the person that is, is characterizes a lot of this intervention and went along with it as a good American soldier. But he also, as I always hark back, was this Quaker kid that was raised to value truth. He was a Hicksite Quaker, which meant he didn't go by the Bible so much as this inner Christ-like voice and this clearness and this, this confidence that Quakers ironically have that he translated into, you know, a marine general. And so it came to this collision, if you will, at the end of his career when, when a lot of that Quaker stuff, background, integrity caught up with him. And he said, wait a minute, this is not what I thought it was. So it's a sense of betrayal that he goes, so to me, is not unlike the betrayal that many Vietnam veterans feel about going to Vietnam and realizing, wait a minute, this war is not what I was told it was about. And that was certainly my experience. Um, so that's why, to me, uh, Smedley Butler is such a, an amazing American character, because he's very American. He, you know, in this idea of thank you for your service, you cannot say that anyone did any more courageous, risky service than someone like Smedley Butler. But the way I always say people thank me for my service, I say, look, don't thank me for my service. Thank me for what I learned from my service. Mr. John Grant, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you. Great interview. Again, John is a Vietnam vet. works a veteran for peace. You can learn more about him by going to his website at thiscan'tbehappening.net. You learn a whole bunch of information. Thank you so much, John. All right. Well, thank you. Take care. Uh, joining us now is the astrophenom, Miss Constance Stellis, our astrologer. You can learn more about Miss Stellis by going to her website at ConstanceStellis.com. Miss Stellis, what can you tell us about Smedley Butler? Well, this is a fascinating chart, and I didn't know anything about Smedley Butler before you brought him to my attention. And I say fascinating. Fascinating because his book is called War is a Racket. And he has, he is a Leo, so he's a natural born leader, which he was, a, I guess, a general, and that's part of his DNA. But he has Pluto, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, and Saturn in the Earth security minded sign of Taurus. And it's like he, no matter what he went into the army to accomplish, the waste of human life, of material, of, of everything it costs to create this racket 
just uh, sent him into a tizzy, and he saw the the waste in very concrete material terms that uh, the result of war is somehow quote unquote improving the economy, but it's an illusion. And I, I mean, I don't know if I if I had seen his chart without knowing this about him, I would have said this guy is a penny pincher, extreme. But we see how his native um, conservative, security-minded positions led him, because of the, the training and his choice in life to be in the military, to um, put forth a, a rather revolutionary idea. And considering that it comes from a, a military person himself, a, a rather evolved idea. So that's the first thing that strikes me immediately. The second thing is that his moon sign is in the relationship sign of Libra and the balance sign of Libra. Um, Libras seek for balance, but the way it's configured in his chart, um, he has a rather pacifist nature without pulling any, uh, you know, without being a, a wussy at all. And he just kind of added up the pluses and minuses of aggression and the results of this and says, this is ridiculous. And it's this kind of very clear practical thinking that um, we're so in need of today, you know, when you just kind of see this 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 waste and people saying oh yeah 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 well that's just the military industrial complex or blah 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 they give lip service to these things but the fundamental truth is that using war to stimulate the economy is a racket is disgusting and uh, well needs to be addressed so I've never read his book but I certainly will after this uh, I also think that his purpose on Earth was to um, put a new slant on something that's, you know, as old as the hills, which is aggression and war, and that he fundamentally is a, a kind of warrior communicator. That's what I would call him. Uh, and putting things in a way that would be very, it would be very hard to argue against him because of his training and because also of the very clear way in dollars and cents or euros and whatever that he sees things. Interesting person. Interesting person. Okay. If you look at the truth that Smedley Butler, or the truth according to Smedley Butler, that he brought out, astrologically speaking, what era of humanity, astrologically speaking, is in the best time frame to be receptive to his message or to even implement his message? In the past or yet to come? Past or yet to come. What era? If you're thinking about this thing for stars, like what? Well, I what? think that he definitely was a, of a royal nature, you know, mm -hmm. and and so perhaps we could invent this story. I say invent because you never know exactly, or at least I don't, for sure, with somebody's past life. But let's say he was a king of France, Leo oftentimes gravitates towards the great excesses of, of, of uh, Louis XIV and all the Louis in, in France. So let's say he was a king of France. And these, uh, the glory of France, they had to raise massive amounts of money to, to wage war. Now we move forward into a, a, a country and an era where there are no kings. And so perhaps this experience kind of opened his eyes and says, wait a minute, I'm not, this is not divine right. God didn't tell me I'm a king. I'm a soldier here, and this is a waste of time and money. So I, I think that um, hearkening to, to times of royalty is where he came from, but where he ended up, and if he comes back to visit us again, we'll be in a much more egalitarian and humanistic um vantage point for the the uh, <laughs> continuation of the of the human race such as it is right now okay and as uh, if you look at the stars and you look at the I guess the chart of America mm -hmm. you look at the chart of the world you know, maybe five ten years ahead 
is there a period of time where you feel that an idea as completely um, fresh as Butler's compared to what was being accepted by the mainstream at the time will be accepted yeah, by Yeah, radical idea, radical idea. And I tell you what I think. Um, right now, Uranus, the planet of revolution, is in uh, Aries. It's martial, it's Mars-oriented, it's action-oriented, it's very bellicose, it's very warlike. But in about two and a half, three years, um, Uranus will move into Taurus. And if there's a ch- and it will stay there for seven years. So I'm believing that this period of time will focus on exactly what he had to say, which is uh, – it doesn't matter who has the right, who's been invaded, who's been blah, 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 blah. the cost of war is a racket. And and if there's any time that's going to become common common wisdom and and create policy, I think it'll be uh, three years from now and uh, throughout the next uh, seven years, and it would be a good thing. This Constance Sellis really enjoyed that analysis. Thank you so much. And to learn more about Ms. Sellis. My Sellers, pleasure. Please go to our website at ConsciousDallas.com. Joining us now is globally respected psychic medium and metaphysical teacher, Miss Carrie O'Connor. To learn more about Miss O'Connor by going to her website at CarrieO'Connor.com. Miss O'Connor, what can you tell us about Smedley Butler? I looked into Smedley Butler's energy. He had so much gold and yellow around his energy. It was going right up his spine. And whenever I see that running, that shows me that he comes in born of what, with what I call the forerunner energy. He comes in way ahead of his time. He comes in to break people out of holding patterns and to have people expand their minds. When this, and, and he wasn't afraid of speaking his mind and he would back himself up. And that I really admire. Sometimes people, just conform because they don't want to, um, they want to be accepted. He did not care about that acceptance. He accepted himself deeply within himself, not where it was ego, but he came from the, his heart and he definitely came here to free people from thinking bigger and wider about the government, about their selves. Uh, when he broke up the corruption happening in, um, Pennsylvania, he didn't care who they were. He went to the elite and shut down their um, illegal operations, and he'd go to the working class too. He didn't. It didn't intimidate him, where the elite get away with, and the wealthy would get away with a lot. I love that energy with him. And has he reincarnated since that lifetime? Has he come back? I'm not seeing him coming back. I see him guiding people, and I'll see this a lot, where the person can uh, come in as a guide. And he guides many people, or he could come in as a teacher, a master teacher, when somebody's going through a part in their life and they need that shot in the arm of backing themselves up and, and taking the risk to speak their mind. I love Ryan. He had a, a um, tattoo from his throat all the way down to his wrist. I mean, waist. That was an eagle. So that's the part where he teaches independence and to be free. He had the globe, so he came in here with a global message and then he had an anchor, so he was here to anchor freedom within the people. And I don't even think he was conscious of it. So I see that he's not incarnated yet, but he shows me that he's deciding to take physical form in a short time. And we're talking about either one, one and a half to three years. He gets a lot more work done. He could work with more people not being in the physical form. He wanted to wait for the earth changing where they're much more open and receptive to his energy. Okay. Do you feel that his message and his findings were more relevant today than when they than what they were when he first came out and stated some of these facts that war was war is a racket according to him? Do you feel that um, there's going to be more traction on his ideas of today now? Yes, yes, I do. It was significant for that time because it helped people, again, get out of the way they perceive the government. In his lifetime, most people handed all their power. They didn't question the people in office or in power or the war decisions. They didn't question it. And so now there's a lot more people that are questioning, should we go to war? Should we be in war? Let's get out of the war. You know, so um, he set that the momentum for people to have the strength and back themselves up as far as questioning the government and what's their intention and to really call on people out 
on many, many wars, and this isn't, it's been for thousands of years, where the war, and the reason why is for money, power control, and it's corrupt. I, I believe war is a racket. Well, will war always be a part of humanity for the duration of our time on Earth? Because some of other points out that war, he says war is a racket, and people are going to be making money off it. So how would this ever cease to exist? Because even if you had a majority of the people on the planet that embrace the idea of the love and the peace, maybe the majority of these people don't have the wealth or political clout as the real people, the real power behind the scenes. How does that shift occur? Or is it possible for it even to occur? Are we destined to live out this life incarnation or life on Earth in a state of perpetual war? I believe that our lifetimes, humanity's lifetime, this lifetime in particular, we're here to bring the end of war. And the more people, when they stop being at war with themselves, having conflicts within themselves, and they stop the petty fighting within the families or the jobs or that kind of thing, that it brings the energy of no more war. And I see a simple image of humanity going to a round table. And to get to that round table, they have to come from their heart instead of their head and the bottom line and all the the money and the racket thing that war creates. It creates a lot of chaos. And people are looking for more peaceful solutions. And when I see this symbol of a great big dove coming down and putting an olive branch in that round table um, energy to humanity right now, it's waking our unconscious subconscious patterns for people to wake up and look at war in a very, very big picture or be willing to say, you know what, maybe there are other agendas in war. Maybe people are having their own private agendas and some people are getting really, really wealthy over war or they have to create war to create the energy of chaos to keep people in a, a disempowered um, p p energetic position. And again, this lifetime, I do see the end of war. Might not be in a couple of years, but I do see over the next, especially, you could say seven to 15 years, there's wars are going to be very different. When we finally wake up where countries have the ability to really understand that we could destroy ourselves and blow up the whole earth if we want to, and people really take it as not just a thought or a fear, but really anchor it in that that's a reality, that a few people have a position to blow up you know, parts of countries and just create that kind of chaos. That's when the people that don't have the money rise up and start putting their their voice, their energy, their their they pull out of the war grids. And the more they pull out, the more it starts crumbling. Miss Carrie O'Connor, thank you for that amazing analysis, on uh, Mr. Smedley Butler, and the state of war and peace, or the trajectory of the peace going forward. Hopefully, a lot of the peaceful um, premonitions that you brought up do come to fruition and we do have a more peaceful world. To learn more about Ms. Carrie O'Connor, please go to our website at carrieoconnor.com. Thank you so much, Ms. O'Connor. Thank you, Ryan. As always, it's my pleasure. Okay, everyone, that concludes today's edition of the Out of Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. Special thanks to our incredible guests and special thanks to the brave men and women worldwide who sacrificed their lives to prevent tyranny, to fight tyranny. We honor you. We honor your friends. We honor your family members. And we take on your fight. And we honor those who fight for peace, who fight to make the world a better place through peace. We can attain peace. We have to want it. We have to achieve it. We can achieve it. And special thanks as always to our virtues, Miss Carrie O'Connor, Miss Lisa Kaza, and Miss Constance Stellas. To learn more about the Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show, please go to our website at OuterLimitsRadio.com. So the next time we meet, my friends, wishing upon you an abundance of peace, love, and fears. Take good care, and thank you so much for listening.